episode 20 was with Max Frost. This was so much fun, and he told us some stories that he's never told before. Honestly, like one of the most hilarious people I've ever talked to in my whole life. And he's super talented. We're bringing it backwards with Max Frost. Oh, like we're, we're, we're doing the smooth into the... We're, we're smoothing into the... We're, we are. Yeah, we're not going to do guys are gonna. Spiel. You guys are going to do the... And now for our next guest. Uh, uh, yeah, no. This guy travels from Tucson in a van down... <laughs> this guy lives in a van down by the river, <laughs> and has been called the Citizen Kane of alternative pop. There you go. I love that you just entered yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. We're here. We're here. Where are we? They we, might be wondering. We are in San Diego. Can I turn this up? Sure. Sorry, we're going to do a rough start right now. Headphones <laughs> up? Yeah, can you turn my headphones up? Of course. Turn my headphones up. Check. Ooh, that sounds good. I One, like two. That. Mm-hmm. Is that better? Yeah, well, I feel like, there we go. Yeah, I okay. feel like you're... I'm not loud enough. Well, you're louder than me is the problem. Okay. I think you to, <laughs> I'll turn myself down. There we go. There we go. Okay, awesome. All right, we're good. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so you grew up in Austin, Texas. I did. Tell me about that. Um, Austin, Texas is a town that is in the red desert. And by the red desert, I don't mean the color of clay or a color of sand. <laughs> I mean uh, the, 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 the direction that... The counties politically swing. Mm-hmm. Okay. It is the, it is the single blue dot uh, in the deep south. Sure, or you know it's really not the deep south. It's like the, you know it's west. It's right, like right. the southwest. <laughs> it's like rattlesnakes and like and the bones of of cows. It's not really as like deep swamp. But so Austin, Texas is a super musical place. If you haven't been there, I'm, most people have heard of South by Southwest. Yeah, 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 of course. Which is its own thing. But people mm-hmm. who say that they know. Austin because they went to South by Southwest is sort of like saying you know someone because you met them drunk on their birthday. You don't oh, okay. really know anything about what they're like. <laughs> right. South you know, South by Southwest is Austin in rare form. It's like an extra couple hundred thousand people. Like sure. every venue is like the Google spot to be and <laughs> yeah. Lady Gaga's walking around eating potato chips and it's <laughs> different. It's not the same all the time like that. Usually what it is is it's a bunch of like Really dope, really authentic, hardworking musicians, you know, people that are either starting careers as singer songwriters that are, you know, horn players, drummers, bass players, keyboard players. I mean, some like really like to this day, some of the best musicians I've ever met in my life are mm-hmm. all just live in that town and, sure. you know, kind of like hang along and are just going for it, you know, yeah. and they're all kind of legends in their own right. But it's, it's a big part of how I really started learning multiple instruments and how okay. I, I would say genre wise kind of how I got drenched in my backdrop is really in blues sure. and in soul music and stuff. Cause it's kind of a big part of it somehow did not as much of the country stuff rolled off on me. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to some of that stuff, but Would, I can't say it was, I mean, I'm into, you know, Americana more than I am into country. Okay. It's interesting. Cause a lot of people are moving to Austin. Like, I mean, LA of course is, and, yeah. and New York city, but that's an, another spot that people are moving to. And like, it is. And I won't go off on a rant about that because I am from there. But what, right. I, what I will say is you know, every time I go back, it feels a little more like Dallas and a little <laughs> less like Austin. I would say Nashville is out, is out Austining Austin right now. Sure. Yeah. That's another big one. Cause it's, you know, it somehow has managed to maintain like, I don't know. There's just a little bit more of like that grit to it. Whereas Austin just, I, I you know, it's like no one even ever says this, but to me it's like the little choices. It's like the graphics, the new venues start t- are choosing to use. Mm. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, it's oh, just, I it's just it. become a little too like gift shoppy. Oh yeah. <laughs> they we turned that here. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, like one do. giant gift shop. <laughs> Austin is turning itself into a house of blues version of itself. Oh man. That's the way I'd put it. Yeah. 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 Which is kind of messed up, but it's, the, it's okay. I still love it. Yeah. And you grew, you grew up there so you can, you're watching it change and you know, but um, I am. <laughs> Quickly. So you started music at at a very early age. Yeah. When did how did you start getting into music? What was the first like instrument? I mean, guitar was the first thing. You know, I I, um, I had this little like classical acoustic that I was just kind of learning chords on. Like I remember I was learning like Nirvana riffs, like the Come As You Are riff, mm-hmm. and learning like Sublime and learning like Sweet Home Alabama on my guitar. Oh wow! But I was I was a kind of a duck to water on guitar. Like I picked up guitar pretty quick. I was a kid. I, I would say I'm. I was a much better 14 year old guitar player than I am a 26 year old guitar player right now. <laughs> Not that I was a better guitar player then, but in ratio to my age. Yeah. Okay. I've become like an average 26 year old <laughs> guitar player where I was like really good at 14. My trajectory steered off as I expanded my focus to other things. Sure. Uh, so you started playing guitar at what, what year? Uh, what age? 14? No, I started oh. at like eight. I was, super oh, wow. I was like okay. eight or nine. 
Yeah. So by 14, I was like a half a decade into playing guitar. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. So I was, wow. I was getting there. So how did you get into music in the first place? You know, I'm not from like a musical family or anything. You know, Austin is definitely a city that you're just going to be around a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. stuff like live music. But it's, I guess for me, you know, my mom just played a lot of great records my whole life. You know, my, my mom, I don't remember us ever listening to the radio. We were always listening to tapes of like the Beatles and the Pointer Sisters and Aretha Franklin mm -hmm. and just great music that I didn't even know. I probably didn't even know most of it by name. I just knew that it was songs that I identified with, you know? Sure. Mainly soul music. I mean, the Rolling Stones, but you know, really the, Ro the Rolling Stones and the Beatles to me are just kind of this British white offshoot of what... Sure. What uh, was soul music in the early 60s? You yeah. Know? They, that's well, what they were all, covering, yeah. Ozzy Brothers and stuff. Yeah, that's that's who they wanted to be, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, all that was ripped off from and the I, early... And now here I am, still wanting to be those guys, <laughs> but being something else because you can't, you know? Right, right, right. So you started off um, with guitar, and yeah. I know you can play numerous instruments. Or just anything. four, really. But oh, you just. can play <laughs> just four. But not like, you know, people say, it's like, there's people out there who probably... It's more impressive to me when people stretch it across, like... Like, you know, going guitar to bass, bass to drums, drums to keys. Like, that's a pretty, you know, they're all tangent to each other. They're sure. all in the the rock quadrant. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I wish I were one of those guys who was like, yeah, you know, sax, fiddle, <laughs> oboe. <laughs> That'd be more like, I don't know. It's a bigger, it's like learning Chinese and English instead of just like, oh, I speak Spanish and Italian. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> so how did you get, um, so you, you learned guitar at early age and then when did you start like playing with people, playing live? Uh, how did that all integrate into your life? Um, I started really playing live a lot when I was like 12, 13. I just like started joining bands. Oh wow. You know, I was like, I was good enough as like a young teen guitar player to be in bands with like 16, 17 year olds, 15 year olds. Were those kids that you just met in school or? Yeah, like there, there was a really cool organization uh, in Austin that was run by like the school of music there. They, in the summer they did this thing called rock camp. Oh, cool. And so you'd basically get like dropped off and they would like have auditions. They would like take all the different instrument players, put them in their own room. They would each kind of come up and do an audition, which is basically just like you play and show us how good you are. Sure. And then they would kind of organize little bands. Oh, wow. So each band had a singer, a drummer, a bass player, a couple of guitar players, maybe a keyboard player. And then you'd spend the next week just like learning a couple cover songs. Okay. Be in the room with a mentor who would basically just try to help you guys get your, your stuff together. And then you do a show at the end of the week and you do a show. We did a show at Antone's which was like skydiving when you're in a 10 year old kid. You're like, wow. holy crap, we're going to play a show at Antos. <laughs> well, yeah. That's be, and what's funny is because it's all the parents of all the kids in all the camps. So it's a lot of bands, but I mean, really it's like a packed room. It's, yeah, it's, it's like totally full... insane. It isn't like a little <laughs> concert recital. It isn't like a little recital. I mean, it's like a packed house of this club and you were like, whoa, it was super, it was super intense. That's really rad. So that's kind of how you got your feet wet in, in playing with other people and, uh, even playing live, I guess, right? Totally. Yeah. yeah. And then from there, how how did you spin off into playing, you know, a solo project? Were you, in, from there, were you, did you join other bands? Like, kind of, I mean, take I, me through that. I like, always was like writing songs secretly. Um, I was never, I kind of always had this hunch that I would eventually be a front man. I never like wanted to do it until I knew that the time was right. I, I find that people like, if you have a dream like that, it's really best to kind of keep that inside until you think you're really ready because people will try to kill that really mm -hmm. quickly. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, of course. So I think um, I just kind of avoided ever saying that to anybody and I never showed anybody my songs or did anything like that. I didn't even really sing in a band until I was maybe 16, 17, just kind of singing backup okay. for somebody. But then I eventually just kind of quietly started like kind of doing my own thing and then um, the way that truly really transitioned into me, I think the first like real records I was ever making didn't really happen until I um, met Hip hop artists in Austin that were like having me do hooks on their songs, oh, and that's awesome. what led me to understanding like what the modern studio process was. So that was the first time you were actually recording. Well, because I was recording before that, but it was just so bad I never would would, would play it for anyone. Like to <laughs> um, me, like a real record, like yeah, a real thing you've recorded, like you're not doing it until you feel like you like, until you're like excited to show people. Sure. And I would go in the studio with bands, and I just wasn't excited about what we were making. It's really hard to make a a band sound good in a studio, mm -hmm. you know, especially a young band that's unexperienced in there. And so, and really even essentially now when you hear like a band's record, it's like, 
yeah, the band played on the record, but it isn't like they all were like, all right, one, two, three, and laid it down. It's <laughs> yeah. not like that oh, anymore. They're yeah. like layering the drums mm-hmm. with all this stuff, and there's, you know, it's it's a very tapered process to get to the to the modern sound, you know. And so for me, it was like, and it was always a hassle. It was like, oh, we had to find someone who would give a studio time and show up, and hours and hours of takes, and then like, I'd you know, walk into the first hip hop session and it would just be like two guys on the couch smoking weed. And then they would like, we'd make a real rec. We'd make a song that I was like, this sounds like some, like this sounds like a record, man. Yeah. Like an hour. (laughs) Cause someone already just made a beat and it was like, wait, I was like, what? Yeah. I've been wasting my time, (laughs) but it was great because you know, there was this whole, there is this whole community of hip hop in Austin that like they embraced me more than anyone I'd ever you know, musically in my, like people were like, you know, they like, well, cool, man, you can play guitar. Like, yeah, that's, you know, but I was mm-hmm. never, I didn't feel really embraced until I met these guys that were like, oh, you can play guitar funky, do it on this beat. Or you can sing soulfully do it. And it was like this whole alien thing to me that making sure. music that way. And that's how I started making records. And then I went to, I graduated high school. Uh-huh. I went to UT for like a year. And that year I was really where I, I hated school so much. I just did nothing, but like continue to make records in my dorm. <laughs> I started releasing stuff. That's awesome. And then that's how I ended up being a solo artist. Wow. So how'd you get hooked up with the with the hip hop guys originally? It kind of it first started because this I remember this dude who was a friend who like went to like ACC with my drummer. His name was Chavion, mm-hmm. and he was like, "Hey man," he was like, or he was this huge, huge dude. He was like six six, and he was like, "Hey man, I know this guy. Like he's a dope rapper in town." you should like, we should link. And I was like, really? I was like, <laughs> you want me to talk? I was like, I don't, I wasn't following. Yeah. And then, um, I remember he, so this, this guy, Kid Jones, right. Who he was, you know, he still releases music in Austin. It's really amazing. And he's like got a following there. And wow. so at the time I was like, wow, this guy's like, okay. I'm like, but this doesn't make any sense. And we go to meet him and I instantly realized, like we go to some house like far on the North side. And like instantly I realized like this guy is, has not been like prepped on what's happening and he is extremely confused on why I'm there and it was extremely <laughs> uncomfortable and then Chavion's just literally like just go like just go like get your guitar man just like go and I literally in my my mom's Prius I had like <laughs> a, 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 a giant heavy Fender a vintage Super Reverb which is like a 70 pound amp Wow! and so I like drag it in this dude's house <laughs> and plug it in <laughs> and nervously just like chuck out some song and his whole vibe toward me completely he like it was like i met him i'd been in the house for over an hour and like suddenly he's like warmed up to yeah he was like oh he's like my (laughs) name's kid (laughs) let's start making music (laughs) and so that's how that happened and then um and that was a couple there was a couple years of that you know i mean i was probably still in high school when i met kid actually oh wow that was later in high school though okay you know and i kept i kept plugging away doing records with him and there was another group called the league of extraordinary g's and just different guys that were making music that, but pretty much I was up for working with anybody who was doing hip hop. Just sure. to me, it was this opportunity to like actually expand like what I was doing. And it just instantly, I just instantly without even knowing it, like I remember, I remember standing in Antones when we were opening as, as a band. Mm-hmm. Like I remember standing in Antones one time and like Gary Clark Jr. is on stage. Like we were opening for him cause he was just like playing in Austin. We would open for him like all the time. Wow. That's crazy. But at the time it was, it was wow. It was like, wow, this guy's, this dude's dope. But there would be like a hundred people in the, like maybe less like at Antones. It would be just like, it's a vibe that people came to see him, but it uh-huh. wasn't like it is, it is, it is anything now. like, and I remember standing there thinking to myself like, Oh, I'm like, man, it's a shame that like, this is the music that we do because we're good at it. But like, no one's ever going to appreciate this again. Uh-huh. And before, everything happened for Gary and every, you know, before the, there's kind of been, I feel like a big revival in, of soul music in, mm-hmm. in my generation. I agree. Yeah. Our generation, yeah. You know, and, um, that hadn't happened yet. So for me doing hip hop was almost like some escape to like actually doing something that felt culturally relevant uh-huh. and cool. And that's what was exciting to me about it. Yeah. That's, and I could play for my parents and they wouldn't get it. That was what was cool to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Um, when was the first time you, uh, you were playing shows in Austin. When was the first time you kind of toured around or played outside of your hometown? Honestly, the first real tour I ever went on was opening for Gary once I became a solo artist. Oh, wow. I, um, I, it all kind of happened at once. I had a song called White Lies that I had made. Yeah, I I was, wanna, we'll talk about that in a, so in a little bit. made that song. It came out. My career really started once that had hit some 
some a little you know had got some wind in its sails. Sure. I signed a deal with Atlantic. Literally, like as I was in New York to sign the deal with Atlantic, Gary hits me. He's like, "Dude, I heard this record you made. This is so sick. Like, uh-huh. what's going on?" And then the next thing I hear is that they're like, "Hey, Gary wants you to come open for him on this tour." And I was like, "That sounds exciting." So then I got my my I got a band together, and I went out and opened for him like basically across America. Wow! And it was definitely like a big uh, a big wake up call to how bad I was at playing live at that time. Really? Yeah, because it was. Look, I mean, it wasn't really a great fit from the beginning. Like, what I do, especially at that time, what came across in my records was, like, maybe something soulful, but it wasn't, like, guitar-heavy at all. Mm-hmm. It was not blues by any means. And I almost tried to, like, cater to what I thought Gary's audience would be by being more jammy and bluesy. Sure. But all that really ended up doing was weakening what came across of my music live and also failing to connect the dots I think for that audience and what I was doing so I was mm. playing every night for like over a thousand people and I would go stand at the merch booth and I would nobody would come and talk to me. like that's how you know your show is bad not just because the label told me it was bad <laughs> but because you know your show is bad when you play it's one thing if you open for like a couple hundred people right but this is I think this is actually something I don't know what kind you know like this is something I think I'd like to get across for anybody who's listening to this who makes music. It's like you have to be honest with yourself about what the world is telling you. Right. You 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 can you you can get crazy if you want and start telling yourself a bunch of shit. Uh-huh. Then maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Don't listen to what you're telling yourself. But when there's an obvious sign, like if you play a show where uh-huh. you opened and there was a thousand people there and not one person comes up to you after the show, you know you need to get your shit together. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it's okay. Cause like, cause like the songs, I knew the songs were good. I just, the show wasn't good. So you, yeah. So you, you just kind of took that as like a learning experience. Like I just I, took that it. That didn't like kind of crush you a little bit as far as. No. Cause it, well, make, it was a slow realization. I mean, it was like every night I was like, okay, like we're getting, you know, people are clapping after we play. Uh-huh. And, I, and I think I'm being a little harder on myself than it really. I'm like, we did sometimes like some people would, but it was definitely like, I guess the difference is I compare that to like what it was like to actually have a show together, be opening for 21 pilots yeah. or when I was opening for fits in the tantrums just the next year and I had a new band and I had a new show. Uh-huh. It was night and day. It's okay. like, you know, when you get off stage and pe- you like lit the room up and people are like, Oh wow. Who is that? What was that? Sure. You sure. know, when you did that, okay. maybe that's, that should be more my point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not so much. You know, when you suck, but like, you know, when you figure it out, whenever your show is good enough to be like, so you're selling merch. People want to talk to you after the show, you know? Right, right, right. right. Well, I want to go back to uh, to White Lies. So you that was you you started writing in your your dorm room, yeah, in school, and then you put that song out. You, did you record that yourself? Just mm-hmm. um, yeah, that. So I was um, after that first year at UT. I went with a friend of mine, Jordan Harrow, who's made basically all the videos of my early career. Was okay. one of my best friends from high school. We decided to go basically live for the summer in Venice, uh, in LA. In Venice. LA, yeah. okay, not in Italy. <laughs> um, and we uh, we just found this little place. This like, I mean, it wasn't that expensive, honestly. At the t- I don't know how we were even able to afford it. We just like split the rent on this like basically one bedroom apartment that we like. I used to use another room as like a like I slept on like almost like a futon kind of bed. okay. And we lived out there for the summer, and um, I remember it was the house belonged to this like Italian like um, vocal singer or vo- vocal teacher. So she had like left even some instruments in the house. But you know, I came oh, with wow. my bass and my little like I had like a little I think it was a single channel M Audio plastic interface that I was using. And okay, um, and I started you know continuing to do my thing, just making beats and mm-hmm. you know. But even at that time, I had like. I was like, I was like seriously releasing music. You know, I was like, not seriously. I mean, I I had like been like making songs and like making videos to songs for like a thousand bucks. Okay. And putting it out and being like psyched on getting like, you know, 5,000 views or whatever. Yeah. Trying to like push that through the, but I remember I came, I I got out to Venice super depressed. Like I like wasn't, I was like super depressed with how this video I just put out had done and compared to the one before, like I had like just broken up with this girl and I, I just was like. I like had expected cause UT made me not a happy person. Like it's just a very big school socially. Like if you're not part of like the Greek thing there, mm-hmm. you just kind of, you're shit out of luck. And like, right. so I just was like, I just felt stuck and I hated school. And like, so I thought like, Oh yeah, I'll go to like LA and I'll enter like adult world. And like, that'll be the answer. But it totally wasn't the answer. Cause you know, LA is even bigger than 
UT Austin and <laughs> and it was like living out in you know in Venice and it was nice weather but I just remember it was so funny it would be being like in the most beautiful place like on the beach literally like basically living on the beach and just being like so depressed and so I was just like you know, and I was smoking too much pot when I was that age. I don't know if, can we <laughs> right. talk about that on this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's and encouraged. maybe that inspired yeah. your withdrawal in maybe. the Adderall. <laughs> I was just doing, yeah, I was doing too many, like, I definitely took, like, mild drugs to as extreme a point as you could, you know, like, whenever I was at UT, I would, I would literally just set an alarm for 5 a.m. and the alarm would not be to get out of bed. The alarm would be to take a, take an Adderall and oh, go back yeah. to sleep because uh-huh. then in 30 minutes to an hour my eyes would just like pop back open yes. yeah I would then do all the school work that I had totally not done till I went to class at 10 a.m. sure then I would not eat like I would just drink mm-hmm. coffee mm-hmm. and then I would be so like high mm-hmm. on coffee and Adderall in the class I wasn't listening to a fucking word they were saying <laughs> yeah. like I was like I was literally I can remember like looking at a teacher and being like there was like an aura around them like your eyes are like not dilating correctly because of the amounts of stimulants in your system sure. like an aura and I would just be looking at that but I would be like thinking of I would like constantly go to the bathroom like singing ideas into my phone yeah you know I love it your Adderall song is amazing thank you yeah but yeah it's like I uh which I was never prescribed Adderall too I, I don't even know, I don't know how I was getting it all the time uh, it's I think fair. just for my friends yeah, yeah. right anyways uh so white lies was literally a song I made because I I can't even, I honestly I don't I remember writing the song but mm-hmm. I really don't I don't really remember writing the song you just I definitely made it in that room and I definitely used this little cheap acoustic guitar she had sure and I don't really remember I remember making the beat and being like this is cool and like listening to it and riding my bike around Venice a lot mm-hmm. and then I remember I wrote like a song to the beat that wasn't at least the the hook I redid I think a couple times. Okay, but I was definitely like, I don't know, I don't really remember putting it to, putting it all together. Not really, because the yeah. more I will go, sometimes listen back to it, I'm like, how did I? You know what I mean? Like, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. the song makes sense, right? You know right, what I mean? Or yeah. I, it definitely wasn't one I like thought my way through. Sure, I don't know. So when you, when you put that song out, then that's it kind of just caught fire, right? It took a while. I could, well, at least this is what I remember. I remember I had just gone back to Austin. Mm-hmm. I had been making little CDs that I put together of like all my music. Mm-hmm. Or like I, I'd, I'd sort of decided what I thought would be kind of like an EP or an album. And like, sure. I was sending it to this dude. I knew who was a graphic designer named Michael Talley who worked at a, um, a print shop called East side Inc., or East end Inc. Okay. In the East side of Austin one of the guys who ran the shop goes walking by his office as he's listening to some of the stuff and he's like hey what is that oh, that wow. turns into the that guy and his partner who owned the print shop they became my managers wow this is in a very this is a pretty short amount of time after i'd come back you know yeah so they become my managers and you know like one of them had had some experience in the music business really more on the tour managing side mm-hmm. and um so we you know, I remember we put this little like EP together and started passing it out during South by, but I had released white lies. Like I'd put it out and tweeted it to my hundred followers. And so it was out there. It was but, out there. Like, but, but nothing. What's funny is if that's the funny thing that I have to constantly remind myself now that like, there's so much more of an infrastructure about like around my life, especially creatively with songs is like, nobody fucking said anything to me. Like this song is going to change. Nobody ever said that. Wow. Nobody ever. Th- and if they thought that they didn't say it, they'd uh-huh. say it now. People retrospectively like to be like, yeah, man, I feel like that. But I remember <laughs> sitting there with those songs and having conversations with people like, yeah, what about this one? Like, yeah, this one's cool too. Like, yeah, this one's dope. I mean, there were definitely moments where I would play people that song for the first time. And it, you know, you know, whenever you're, starting to like emerge as someone who's creative uh-huh. I think a big thing to sh- you know you've done something great when people even though they know you make stuff go you made this mm-hmm. sure that yeah. moment you know what yeah, I'm saying yeah, 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 yeah. if you can get that that's right. a great thing and so I got that from that song it was like wait what like, like you like this you, is your this is you yeah this isn't a cover like yeah, you wrote this you wrote this <laughs> which I what's funny is to almost like years into my career I would like I remember opening for Fitz and like White Lies honestly is a song it's like one of those songs that it kind of lived its own life in this mm-hmm. weird way you know like like for people who have no clue who I am know that song you know right and I, remember I was opening for Fitz one night and I got super pissed because this girl comes up to me after the show and she's like that lost song you played like 
who's that by? Uh, <laughs> and I remember just being like, oh, that's my song. Like, no, 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 but like, seriously, like, <laughs> whose song is that? I'm like, I fucking hate you. <laughs> Go away. Um, that's awesome. That is awesome. So you, so the song, it's doing its thing. Yeah. And then is it, this- it was blog, it was like blogosphere. Really what happened is we did a South by I went to pass out this CD around to everyone. Were you playing South by it? I, I was doing a couple little, I did a couple little showcases, not very many people there. Came off of South by, super disgruntled, like, okay, whatever, I'm going to go back to school. Especially when the next week I went to go do a South by hangover show at the Mohawk in Austin in the uh-huh. inside room. I put my stuff down in the green room, a backpack with a computer in it and a hard drive in it that was all the music I'd been making for like all those years. Uh-huh. And a guitar that was a guitar I'd had since I was like, 15 like an sg that i'd like saved up money for and oh, it was wow. like the guitar yeah and i walked back upstairs to get ready for this show later to go to the green room and that shit was gone oh it was my gone forever god and i like literally like got on the stage like during some, like between someone's set like got on the mic and i'm like yo someone in here knows like i knew somebody yeah, knew something somebody stole my stuff you know and oh it was my fuck, god. it was messed up man. yeah like, yeah I, wow. I'm still when I think back about that I'm bitter because I just like I know there's someone I know who like knows what happened to it sure I think I don't know I'm like how could all but there was a lot of you know like the relays were that weekend it's like there were so many people it was a free event people were coming in and out Mm -hmm. I don't know but that how all the music you had worked on so you did you lose everything I mean everything so there was probably songs in there that you oh you can't remember and oh yeah that might be coming out soon which is the crazy (laughs) thing about about White Lies is that um so then like literally two days later, this pigeons, this blog called pigeons and planes uh-huh. picks it up that launches it in, which the blog itself isn't necessarily that big at the time, but it was just like, it picked it up. And then the next thing I knew it was like so many, blo- it was like probably, it was probably the only time in my career I ever really remember feeling like, Oh, this is like a, like this is a viral moment. And when sure. like you know, it was like legitimately like explosive. Like I've never really had that happen again the same way, or at least I haven't been able to measure it because I've, been at a place where when something like that happens again, like you're like, okay, is this just more or is it to go from zero to a hundred? Yeah, like that you, a song. yeah, because that was your first real big jump. Yeah, you know, I was like talking to all these labels. What's funny is it never really came up in conversation. Like I don't really remember ever discussing this with any of the labels. Who like it was clear like they wanted to sign me for one reason, uh-huh. that song. Mm-hmm. Like they were interested in like, oh, so you made it yourself? Like that's cool. Like blah 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 blah. They didn't really but, like. Atlantic Records seemed the most interested in me as an artist, uh-huh. which I liked. But they literally signed me on a song that, to the day they signed me, they did not understand. I think that I didn't, I did not have a stem to that. Okay, meaning like a file. Like there was no, there was no like we're gonna mix this now. Oh, because yeah. it's got it's, stolen. This is it. Like this is the song. Right. Oh I think I God. was able to dig up like some Dropbox that had some stems. And then this guy named Tom Elmhurst, who's like the man, like he mixed like Adele and shit. Oh, wow. They had him and Craig Kellman sat in an office and tried to mix it again. But something was just, it was like the, 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 the stems themselves were MP3s. Okay. So it yeah. was not, it was just not happening. Like yeah, it wasn't, it was, we couldn't get it. So we went to the races with a mix that was literally my mix I had made stoned off my ass oh at 19 my God. with like a pair of like <laughs> Dre beat headphones. Yeah. I couldn't even afford Dre beats. I don't even know what kind of headphones I had on. Probably these ones that we gave you. Yeah, these pieces. <laughs> the Amazon <Yeah>. special. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> So when these la- so you signed to Atlantic, but other labels were courting you at this time, or or like calling kind of, you up. You know, or- I, so I I um a big part of the story with is uh this is I've never actually explained this on a, a podcast before or anything like this before because we never have had the time. But so one of the managers at the time is he's a guy named Eddie Levy, right? Uh-huh. And Eddie Levy is a Mexican Jew. Right, <laughs> which is a rare thing, but that, yeah. it exists. <laughs> it <does. right? laughs> Eddie Levy got married in Mexico City uh-huh. to uh, who is now Noah Levy, his Mexican Jewish wife. Okay, and a guy, a Jewish guy named Kinky Friedman, who is a pretty known figure in Texas. He ran for governor. He's a songwriter. He's a he's a writer. Very uh, very eccentric cowboy dude he's known in texas i mean he he really he could have he almost became the governor of texas wow. i think he got like 20 30 percent of the, i mean he was the so eddie knows him somehow uh-huh i think from like camp or something like but then he's much older than eddie okay he goes to the wedding and he writes 
an article that ends up in the New Yorker or the New York Times or something called My Mexican Jewish Wedding. And it's just a story about how he went to this Mexican Jewish wedding and just uh-huh. talking about that cultural clash that like, or not clash, but that interesting mm-hmm. yeah. blend. A guy named Michael Reinert is a very successful, prominent music business lawyer living in New York City, reads this article. He's also coincidentally obsessed with plays and okay. reads this article, gets a hold of Eddie. This is back years before Eddie and I met. And he's like, my name is Michael Reinhardt. I would love to write a play about your life. <laughs> That's or whatever lot. he said. He's like, he was like obsessed with the idea of this Mexican Jewish wedding. It'd be a fantastic play. <laughs> That's exactly how he talks. And uh, so then they get in touch. Eddie knows Michael now. And when he first met me and he start, and we started working together, he talked to Michael about me and he was like, um, but Michael was like, eh, no, I don't, I don't shop projects. You know, best of luck. I don't. Uh, that's not what I do. Because he's, I mean, he's, he's like, he's Stevie Wonder's lawyer. Oh wow. He's like, a, he's like a guy. Yeah, he's yeah, like yeah. the guy. He was at Universal. He was like the Universal head of business affairs. I mean, this guy knows. He's like the man. Right, right, right. He's been around a long time. Mm-hmm. And um, like, if you see the Ray Charles movie with yeah. Ahmet Erdogan, who started Atlantic Records, yeah, like yeah, Michael yeah. like has had points in his life where he was like a lawyer sitting there at a table between Ahmet Erdogan and like Clive Davis and being like, so who are we dropping this year? Like you're having that conversation. He's like been around. So then this thing happens with Why Lies and the conversation of my actual ability to like be a real artist in the world Uh actually starts to come to light. So Eddie reaches back out to Michael. Michael agrees to become my lawyer. He's now, he's been like a father to me. He's become like, you know, he was a bit, I explained all that to say that Michael was a big piece coming into it that Uh took it from like, there's a song with a buzz and some serious label interests. He was able to really stir that up into like, we we met with everyone. Like I met with David Geffen. I mean, I'm not not Geffen, but uh, what's the band that signed uh, Mumford and Sons? Um, Glass Note. That's right. Yeah. Last Note Records, Republic. I think most, that was the, it was like White Lies got us in the elevator uh-huh. and Michael was able to hit 10 instead of one. God. We went from being like, oh, we're going to meet with some A&R guy at uh-huh. Republic to like, we're going to meet with Monty Lippman. Oh, okay. And Avery, you know I mean? We're going to go talk to those guys. Yeah. It's that, which that just didn't guy. happen usually unless they were like, the deal has been done. Like, sure. here we go. But, you know, the guy who, the A&R who first reached out to me in Atlantic was a guy named Aaron Bashuk, who was no joke. I mean, he'd signed Bruno Mars. He mm-hmm. was, you know, a young up-and-coming guy. He now runs Warner Brothers Wow, as, as the guy over there for Warner Music. Uh-huh. Came from Interscope, you know, which is another part of the, of the waves that have crashed against my boat as I've been <laughs> traveling across this ocean of the music business. <laughs> Getting signed, and then less than a year later, he left, which is a super hardcore way to... Oh, you don't want that to happen. Yeah. I've, I've heard of stories like that where people will sign to it like a label just because they're like, this is my guy here. And then he's gone. That's and sort then, of like saying that's sort of like someone inviting you to go on a road trip from New York to LA. And then right around the time you get to like Nashville, mm-hmm. they fly home <laughs> <laughs> and give you the key and leave the keys in the car. And go, <laughs> Good luck. <"Best> of luck. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Love Aaron though. I mean like, you know, but, th- but he had, to, that's just the way life is. He had, right. I remember when he called me, I thought I could tell in his voice, something was really serious. I thought he was, but tell me I was dropped. Already. I was like, what? <laughs> and then he told me he was just leaving and I was like, Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I didn't even understand how big of a deal that was at that time. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And that's, you know, he had to go do his thing, you know? Sure. 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 So you got signed to Atlantic. You put out, Two EPs and then you just and then you just put out this this record this last album, year or yeah. this li- yeah album last year <laughs> right love it Thank yeah you. and Tara's a, in love with it Thank I you. think it's an amazing album as Thank well you, Appreciate um, it. so I well I just really love um, so I'm gonna give you my two favorites yeah. uh, I love slow jams thank you it like <laughs> an asshole like uh-huh. is amazing because Adam kind of has that same policy no apologies yeah. so <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad people get that song yeah yeah I was really worried when I that's actually one of the only songs that I was like I'm really worried about this oh it is my favorite that's her favorite song on the album Good. right yeah. away she's like this the best song is asshole and she sends yes. it to me <laughs> yeah just even calling it that like I remember Fitz being like if you see a song on a playlist called Asshole. You're not <laughs> not going to click that. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Because I, like, I was like, I don't want to call it that, man. I want to call it like No Apologies and we settled on Asshole with Dollar Signs. Yeah. Parentheses, No Apologies. I love it. I love it. 
Um, how did you get? Yeah, so you you opened up for Twenty One Pilots on a tour and yeah. and Fitz and Tantrums. Like, how yeah. did you get hooked up with those guys? Fitz, I remember meeting pretty early on. I I, I went. Um, I think like probably the first year or two that I was probably the first year I was signed. I like I went to something and got his new record that had just come out. And and I, when I was on tour with Gary Clark Jr., I remember hearing that song. Um, uh, more than just a dream on the radio like mm-hmm. all the time oh yeah and i loved that record i was like man this song is so great you know because it was like a soul song it was like a pop song yeah song. yeah and their their first real hit was a soul cover wasn't totally it? yeah and i saw them live at Stubbs in austin like a friend took me to see them and i was like wow okay this band's got stuff going on and but i've been listening to the album and i'd heard that this other song that hadn't been taken to radio yet called uh um the walker Oh, it was yeah. On oh yeah. And I remember seeing, I went to a, <laughs> oh, a Warner after party after the Grammys. I didn't go to the Grammys. I went to some after party. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I see him standing there. I see Michael Fitzpatrick, the singer standing there. So I just walk up to him and I'm like, Hey, what's up, man? I'm Max. I uh, just want to say like, been checking out your record. I think that song's going to be a hit. Uh, the, the Walker. I'm like, yeah. that's going to be the big one. He's like, your lips to the sky, my friend. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and luckily his manager was like standing there and she her name is lisa and and she somehow knew me of me through someone so she kind of more properly introduces us and we talked and it was like we should do a session so then a couple of weeks later we did a session and we got along you know we, we made some music and then they asked me to come out on tour and wow it was fun a lot of fun yeah that's awesome i mean that song just your lips to the sky i mean look hey, you're yeah. the reason why i became <laughs> they this. knew that, that was <laughs> Adam doesn't hear it, but I swear that your song "Die Young" totally mm. reminds me of Badfinger. Yeah, it, that's it. That is something that's been brought to my attention before, and uh, and I'm sure if I slowly watch that song creep into a place of like massive financial success, I would hear it from Paul McCartney's lawyers, <laughs> and, Apple, and I would just be like, "Well." <laughs> what you gonna do about it? Yeah, no, right. it's, it's different. I don't see. It's, I don't hear it. I like yeah. look. But it, what I, what I would either. argue. I mean, I'll say this. I'll say this. I never was familiar with that song, <laughs> and never, in any way, meant to. But what it is is it's because. Then I would also say I don't think it's actually their intellectual property because it's really just a major scale mm-hmm. being walked up. Yeah. yeah, right. It's just the part. Just this one part of the melody. The chords are different. I would, I've, it's just, it's come up a couple times where people have asked really? me about that and I'm like, I didn't, you know, to be honest with you, that's stuff. It, I 100% had never heard that song in my life. I, that, yeah. That's what's crazy is yeah. cause like I listen to it and I'm, not, and I'm like, what are you talking about? This isn't <laughs> anything like this song. Same with my dad. He couldn't <laughs> it's, just, it's just a melodic, there's just this little melodic tag moment that's got enough of a ca- cadential similarity to it <laughs> yeah, just, that it could be argued that there's enough of a similarity for it to be a bite, but I don't there's think way so. bigger yeah. bites happening no. out there. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. AKA Ariana Grande. <laughs> totally. and these people just like literally yeah. singing cover songs with new words. Uh, yes. Sure. Like yeah. Weird Al Yankovic <laughs> led the way of how to be a pop star now. Right. Just write someone else's song with your own <laughs> dumb words. Yeah. Your own goofy lyrics. Well, yeah. And I just, I, I, I love, love all of your lyrics. Like you. you're a, an amazing poet. Like Adam thinks it's weird that I read your lyrics, but like, you know, no, I don't think it's weird that you read her. I just, every time I ask you what you're doing, you're like, I'm just reading uh Max's lyrics. <laughs> Cause like I, your songs speak to me and I like, I know that you have the Beatle influence from your mom and, you know, playing that. And, you know, I just love that you talk about Paul McCartney when you're talking about like, you know, (laughs) it's just like, that's so cool. People interpret that line as like, I'm saying like, forget about Paul McCartney. No. I've had to, I've defended on the radio before. I'm like, it's like a, it's like a punchline reference. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a yesterday. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) But the funny thing is a, a lot of people are like yesterday. Yeah. I love Smash Mouth. Like that's the world we're living in now. The Beatles, the yeah. people don't know. People don't even know. It's sad. It's a sad, sad world. Yeah. Or people I, don't know that he, yeah. like they wouldn't make the connection. Like they don't know that like Paul's the one who wrote that song. Like, I remember some interview with John Lennon where he's talking about, he's like, and I was in Amsterdam and the, ins- and the, the violinist insisted on playing yesterday in my ear. <laughs> and asked me to sign it. <laughs> it's like a, <laughs> didn't want to have to tell. I didn't have the heart to tell him. You know? <laughs> that was a great. Yeah, you should do friend. voiceovers. Oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah, you should. That Apparently, was... it's not their voices on the Yellow Submarine. Did you know that? Oh, no, I did not. it's just people faking their voice. 
Wow. You can tell when you listen back to it, you're like, yeah, that's totally not them. That's funny. It's that, fake. I didn't know that. It is like more like American sounding. Like well, it's just like people of... faking their voice, you know, because yeah. the voice is really particular. Here. The best uh, uh, John Lennon interview I remember hearing was somebody asked him like, oh, do you think uh, Ringo Starr is the best drummer in the world? And he's, he's like, like it's not even the best drummer in the Beatles. Yeah, <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so amazing. All right. Well, thank you, Max. I appreciate it. We we appreciate it. Thanks for having uh, us. Yeah, thank and the, fun. the last question here is uh, just: Do you have any advice for aspiring artists? Make shit that makes you slightly uncomfortable and that surprises yourself and surprises people around you because. Life is too short and it's way too easy to make stuff that's just like, uh, that's agreeable and that's comfortable. Like I think you should be always, I think what happened for me was I, the hip hop thing made a significant impact on my life musically because it forced me to go somewhere I really wasn't comfortable with, Uh huh. you know? And, and, and by that I don't mean write songs that are like offensive. I don't, I'm not talking about being offensive. I'm talking about um, creatively coming from a place that's a little bit deeper into a particular water than you're used to going. Sure. Because then that's where I think you'll actually become vulnerable or at least you'll, you'll find something new. If you're trying to do something that's already in your wheelhouse that you know you can do, uh-huh. that's just boring as shit. And everyone, right. everyone knows when you're doing something that's just what you do. It's the reason, I mean, I'm going to go, yeah, I mean, it's like the reason that like, country music has has put a ceiling over itself and that house is slowly getting smaller and smaller <laughs> yeah. yeah because they just decided it's this and everyone's just doing that and no one really can yeah, break that, that yeah exactly yeah.